<laughs> just just in time. <laughs> All right. Well, I will. Uh, what I'll do is I'll allow you to unmute yourself um, when you're ready, Brock, and the tool is turned off. Um, and in the meantime, Juita, it's lovely to have you here. Uh, Juita is a PhD student in Louisiana, and uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see her come on and uh, and chat today. So please take it away, Juita. Let's let's kick this off. Cool. Hi, everybody. I will also say my house is also under construction. Apparently, houses in Louisiana just they they can't they can't stand the weather. I don't know. So ignore this really <laughs> big thing behind me. <laughs> um, so yes, I if you didn't know, I study brown pelicans here in Louisiana. Half of the things that I have learned, I've actually learned from Brock Geary himself. So I'm a huge fan, and I chose his paper. Um, called Breeding Brown Pelicans Improve Foraging Performance as Energetic Needs Rise. And I'm just going to give a quick summary of what this paper covers, and, um, and then we can get into the questions and chat, which I'm really excited for. Um, so this paper is surrounded by something called optimal foraging theory. This basically means that the organism will want to maximize the amount of food that they eat in respect to how much energy it takes to get that food, whether that is traveling a really long distance or um, just the act of actually getting the food. This can also be seen as how efficient any given predator is. Um, especially in Louisiana, our coastline is ever changing and these organisms need to be able to change with their feeding strategies um, based on the energy requirements that they may need and the organisms that can change their behavior um, are more likely to survive as well. So shifting gears specifically to marine ecosystems where a ton of the top marine predators, such as the brown pelicans, tend to feed on smaller fish that are found in really big like clumps, really big groups. But unfortunately, these really big groups are spaced out the ocean is pretty big. <laughs> um, and these brown pelicans are also known as central place foragers, which basically means that they come back home between feedings because this is where their nest is at. Whatever location they come back home to is where their nest is at, is where their children are, or chicks, I should say. <laughs> um, and due to this need to return home, it is thought that these organisms have to have some idea as to where their food is located. So for example, we would go to the fridge. We, we know where the food is located. So these pelicans also have some sort of idea just to make it a very efficient trip. Um, so if the prey is found in really high numbers, like they're really abundant, they're found everywhere, these predators would not care where they went because their chances of finding the food is pretty high. Versus if the prey is found in really low numbers, it's really important for the predators to know uh, where the food is and to establish where that location is pretty quickly. Um, and something to really keep in mind is being able to measure this in the real world hasn't been easy or even available until very recently because all the technological advancements. Now we're able to measure this um, because, for example, brown pelicans travel large spatial scales. And without this technology, there's no way this paper would have ever been able to uh, be published. And I'm super excited to talk about it. Um, the study question that Brock and his team were looking at is how is to better understand how brown pelicans track their prey items, specifically a fish called Gulf Menhaden, which make up about 95% of their diet. That's a lot. Imagine like eating McDonald's 95% of the time wild um and their hypothesis was that as the increased need uh, for the energy energetic requirement which means basically feeding themselves as well as their little chicks um, as this increases they need to utilize um, higher quality feeding grounds at the same time which means places that have more fish in them so their second hypothesis is that the brown pelicans should be using these higher quality um, feeding grounds um, more than the landscape is changing over time. So there's an actual behavioral component to what these pelicans are doing. 
So I, if you saw the paper, you may have thought to yourself, where is the methods? Because I did the same thing. The methods at the end, but I thought I'd just like do a little bit of a spiel in the order that most of us are used to, <laughs> um, just to like have a flow to it. Um, so Brock and his team did something called um, utilizing different layers and making a model out of these layers. And one of these layers has the men hating data. And this is basically from commercial fisheries where they specifically the places and times in which they caught these men hatens. So we have a location, right? And then on top of that, they utilize remote sensing data, which is apparently free. I didn't know this. It's free on the internet. You can find it, which is awesome. And then on top of that, they had tagged birds. So brown pelicans that received a GPS tag. So they knew exactly where these pelicans were feeding. Um, and they basically modeled it to see the areas that brown pelicans occupied versus uh, compared to the foraging data. And as well as places that brown pelicans could have occupied, but they didn't. So some really cool results from this paper was that sea, sea surface temperatures, specifically between 30 and 32 degrees Celsius, which for uh, us Americans <laughs> is 86 to I mean, 89 degrees Fahrenheit, and chlorophyll A were the most important factors to the menhaden distribution, which is the fish that um, mostly make up the brown pelican's diet. They also utilize pelican characteristics, which includes um, the sex of the pelican as well as the body conditions. Um, they also found that um, that birds with, okay, sorry. <laughs> I might need Brock to explain this. He explains it way better than I do. <laughs> um, pelicans occupied a significantly poorer a feeding habitat in the beginning of the breeding season that versus the end of the breeding season, which leads them to believe that um, there is a behavioral component to them choosing and learning where the fish are more abundant, which is awesome. That is great. Um, what makes this paper so great is that, to my knowledge, Brock is one of the very few people that have utilized this method of like using the different layers which encompasses not only um the foraging ecology and the habitat but also putting in the prey distribution there is one other paper i believe someone can correct me if i'm wrong that utilizes this method with wolves which means this is this could be used across different species and interrelated species and give us a better understanding um, on a broader scale of how these species interact, um, especially with food web dynamics. Um, I think this method can become extremely useful, especially since we have an ever-changing climate and environmental conditions are changing and degrading. Some are getting better, some are being restored. Um, and a lot of this data is accessible to a wide audience, um, which gives us the ability to measure these changes and utilizing this method could give us a better understanding of how different species interact, which is just so cool to me. Um, and that's basically what I have for the summary. <laughs> um, do I give questions or are we taking audience questions? Please, question away, Juita. The, the floor is yours. Oh, okay. I, I thought it would be fun to ask. <laughs> Brock might not be keen to this. <laughs> what is your favorite part of like working out here? It's a harsh condition to work in. Yeah, the temperature is not my favorite part. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I would say that, um, like many of us in this group, you know, we all have a pretty good affinity for seabirds, and the field seasons, while long, um, really do give you a lot of time to be uh, intimately associated with these birds, especially, um, you know, Juita's doing a lot of observations of, of their nesting ecology and um, I spent a lot of time just just looking at pictures and videos of pelicans, um, but having them in the hand is also a really neat and inspiring and kind of um, gives you a more personal connection to it while you're sitting at your computer for most of the year, just kind of looking at them as, as points on a screen. Um, yeah, and then just being able to, uh, as Juita said, um, look at these behavioral processes over such a large spatial scale. I know people have been tracking seabirds for some time, um, but having that kind of Looking at the big picture at your desk, 
and then you know real real small picture as you've got these individual birds in the hand um the, that, the interplay between those two things is uh, is really in, inspiring to me to be engaged cool okay as someone who has learned everything they know about pelicans and field work with pelicans basically from you like i learned how to ban pelicans from rock um as well as put gps tags on them uh what's your favorite embarrassing moment that we've had out there <laughs> Sorry, we've had a few um <laughs> I wouldn't say any of the boat breakdowns are my favorite. Um, I don't know. I think ex get, bringing people out there, uh, you know, to meet the Pelicans for the first time is probably, um, you know, some of my favorite moments out there and just seeing, you know, people's reactions to being out, out on a colony. Um, yeah, and then just uh, the injuries are often pretty embarrassing when you get back from the field. Um, a lot of people see a photo of a pelican. It looks very majestic. It's got this long, slender bill. Um, but once you've got one in the hand, you realize that uh, they have a lot of wear and tear out there. Um, so there can be some serrations <laughs> that appear <laughs> on the bill. It can be pretty jagged. And so uh, when you got a pelican in the hand, uh, we typically keep one finger, you know, between the upper and lower bill. And uh, while we're working on them, they can gnaw on you pretty good. So when you get back from the field and your hands are just completely ripped apart, uh, you've got some pretty interesting stories. To friends. Oh. <laughs> I think I heard some gannets there cut who were agreeing yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will say there was this one time we accidentally pulled the kill switch on the boat and we thought the boat just broke in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. We were literally in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and we were like, I don't know, we have to call like the water sheriff. And an hour and a half into waiting for the water share, if we realized we pulled the kill switch. On the board. <laughs> That's all Sorry, Rob. I had to tell that one. Right there. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what basic boat facts you can forget <laughs> at the moment. Dangling <laughs> from your belt. Yeah. So what are what are your next steps? Like, what do you want to do next? What are the gaps in the knowledge that we should try to fill? Yeah. So. Um, a lot of my research, like a big interest of mine is, you know, looking at these individual level processes and, you know, seeing how variation in individual level behaviors uh, shapes population level uh, patterns. And so I, I previously published a paper that really focused more on the individual side of things and looking at variability in like foraging site fidelity and energy expenditure in these birds. Um, and then kind of use this as kind of like the population level counterpart. This to, uh, of my dissertation and a couple years ago. Um, and so at the end of this paper, if you got to the discussion, you can see that there's a lot of different things going, you know, the northern Gulf of Mexico, the Louisiana coast is a very busy place. Um, there's a lot of people out there, you know, fishing boats, um, a lot of different landscape cues that these birds could be using to identify these high quality foraging patches over the course of like the beginning of the breeding season, you know, looking for menhaden fishing boats, you know, that's where we got our, our fish data. They're out there at the same time that the pelicans are breeding. Um, shrimp boats, marine mammals, other seabirds, other pelicans. Um, so I'm really interested in um, trying to figure out, you know, what, what are these individual birds, what are they queuing in on? Um, are there any individual characteristics that are associated with strategies? Are there some strategies that are more um, energetically costly to, to adopt? Are there some birds that can do things that others can't? Um, and how does that ultimately affect uh, things about breeding success? Um, so I was, I've started getting a project off the ground that's kind of on hold for funding reasons right now. Um, and I have seen some European uh, papers that have used this approach, um, but I would really like to get some micro video cameras on these birds um, and their perspective, um, see what they're actually queuing in on, seeing what sort of local enhancement or interspecific interactions might be going out there that shape their foraging strategies. Um, and I'm also sitting on a really large accelerometer data set that I have not utilized to its fullest extent yet. Um, so getting in there, I'd really like to finally classify those behaviors um, that we get from that data set um, and associate energy expenditure with those to see what really shapes the outcomes um, of the strategies. So those are the two closest goals. Awesome. I think the gannets agreed. Yeah. I can hear them. <laughs> <I> can, <laughs> they're like cheering you on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Better the Pelicans than us, they say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions from the audience? Does anyone have a question for Brock? Davida, I'm sure that you must have a question or two in your belt. Uh, yes, can you, can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, excellent. No, thanks. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed uh, reading the paper. And, uh, and, and I think uh, definitely trying to, to link seabird behavior with the actual prey base uh, and not only with uh, SST and chlorophyll is, is clearly the way to go. And uh, as, as you stated, there's uh, only a handful of studies uh, which, which actually do this. Um, uh, for instance, in, in the North Sea or in, in the California current, uh, in the Benguela or in the Western Mediterranean, there's, there's only a handful of them. And uh, while well, I, I certainly forget one or two, uh, but uh, it's, it's incredibly hard to, uh, to get good information on the prey base. So, uh, so well done, uh, well done on this. And I, I was intrigued by uh, what you, you found uh, for the uh, early part of the breeding season when you said that the birds forage in a suboptimal uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think my, my interpretation is, is that uh, in many instances, um, the, uh, the birds are, are better than, than we are at locating and exploiting uh, prey. So, uh, so what you, you actually analyze and, and figure as a, a suboptimal foraging environment might be just a, a, a bias in, in the prey-based data and, uh, and the birds might actually face a completely different reality. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good, good point, David. You certainly do see that. It's, I, I guess Brock, like, so what, what are the, are there any inherent biases in, in the prey data that you have? Um, what, how was it, how is it compiled? Um, these come from captain's daily logs of this uh, commercial Menhaden uh, fleet. You know, anytime a net goes in the water, um, this is, you know, it, they're not, they're not going to drop it if they're not going to catch anything. Yeah. Um, this is really, um, you know, at least high quality presence data. Um, if you look at the spatial coverage, um, they cover pretty much all of the Louisiana coast. They're not, you know, just got these like hot spots that they're hitting. Um, so I don't think it's that spatially biased. Um, but again, there could be some areas that, you know, different environmental characteristics, maybe a little bit further off the coast that they might not be going. Um, we do see the pelicans kind of sticking to the near shore. So there is a pretty good overlap there. Um, but I do think that there are some, you know, you've always got to um, consider the biases of a, of a present only base, um, which we tried to rectify with, um, you know, simulating these foraging points where the pelicans didn't go and comparing where they actually were. Um, to try to that. Yeah. Davida, you still there? Yes, uh, yes, I'm still, uh, I'm still with you. And, um, and I, I, th I think uh, what you stated about, you know, the accelerometry data probably bringing in a, a lot of additional information to, uh, to fine tune your, your analysis, you'll, you'll probably uh, get a lot of additional information out of that in terms of, uh, you know, the, the energy, the, uh, the birds uh, use uh, area uh, with, with respect to the prey base. So that, that would be another layer you could add to the analysis. Well, are you certainly aware of that already? Yes, for sure. Um, and, I, I, you know, I'm really interested in identifying these individual behaviors and linking those to energy expenditure. Um, in, my, in the previous paper I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, I was able to, at least in my first pass through the data, um, calculate um, overall dynamic um, acceleration, the ODBA, um, which just kind of gives you a broad idea. It's a, it's a general correlate of energy expenditure. Um, so I was able to calculate that for individual birds foraging trips. Um, and see that these birds in better condition were able to, um, they're doing something that's more energy there, um, but they're maintaining this more energy, you know, more expensive strategy um, based on this, on this broader metric, um, which is really interesting um, to me. So being able to get a little bit more in the weeds with that um, is something I'd like to explore soon. Very cool. Um, Brock, you still there? I just had one little quick question: Is um, your your Menhaden data? Um, is there any indication that the population of Menhaden uh, has changed over time, uh, whether that be spatially or um, with regards to their population size? 
Um, yeah, so they do publish stock assessments and, um, you know, according to, according to those, the fishery is still considered sustainable, but I mean, they've got millions of tons of these fish that they're taking out of the water every year. So it's definitely something worth um, monitoring to make sure that it remains sustainable. I have some concerns about it. Um, and the question brings up another really important point when it comes to conservation issues or just general ecological issues in the Gulf of Mexico is that um, just south of Louisiana, um, or just south of my study area rather, uh, we had to have a, a pretty good piece of one of the world's largest hypoxic zones. Um, so, you know, Louisiana is pretty much is where the Mississippi River ends. So we've got all that input coming from every state that borders the Mississippi um, and contributes to the hypoxic zone that, that, uh, that emerges every summer. Um, so that might be something that's keeping the birds from being able to utilize those more southerly marine habitats as much as they might want to. Um, and this also disrupts the distribution of the birds, uh, or not the birds, the fish out there. Um, you know, you've seen menhaden uh, die-offs in response to that. Um, so that's definitely um, something worth considering um, when thinking about the menhaden populations over, over the long term. Yeah. It's actually funny that whenever we have the hurricanes come through, it's that part of the year, that's one of the uh, small benefits, I guess, because the hurricanes can come through and mix up the water. Yeah, um, I was least, say that must break things up a little bit, hey? Yeah, at least it knocks out the hypoxic zone a little bit, but we've got yeah. a lot of horrible things that come along with it. So yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, I think we, we had a question in the from the audience there. We had uh, Mariana was going to ask a question. She's got her hand raised and everything. Look at you, Mariana. I'm impressed. <laughs> All, right. All right, go go for it, Mariana. You're 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 up. Hello. I learned to raise my hand this time. <laughs> <laughs> Moving up in the world. Yes. Um, no, I just wanted to say that is, uh, this is uh, very, very interesting. And um, I actually um, had a, a similar thought when I was uh, uh, looking at the uh, GPS data of, uh, of my PhD, because I did also notice that uh, early in the, in the breeding season, my seabirds, they were going to, uh, to basically the same spot of the previous year, which wasn't a, a, a good one. But then uh, they basically, after the first foraging trip, they shifted to basically what was a very good spot. So your your finding really made me think of what uh, uh, of what I saw, and I was like, ha! <laughs> so I, I was wondering if uh, you um, you actually uh, have then uh, uh, the variation uh, the, uh, the variation across different uh, different years, or you were planning to because it might be um, also a matter of I don't I don't know if uh, if it is a matter of memory or like remembering where they were the, the previous year and then trying again and failing again. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. We did see significant annual variation in the overall foraging habitat quality. Um, so there is, you know, so, you know, they are dealing with kind of a different landscape um, in some way from year to year. Um, and in terms of memory, I think that's really interesting too, because um, the, the, I think the jury is still a little bit out on breeding site fidelity of these birds. We have a long-term banding database um, that I believe Juita is digging into um, for some of her work. Um, and also, I don't know about your study system, um, but the brown pelicans are, um, they migrate in. A lot of them will leave, um, go down to Central America. Um, so they don't really have the opportunity to, you know, keep track of the marine environment in the non-breeding season. Um, so I think, it w yeah, it is really interesting to think about how their memory, you know, of the previous year might guide what they do, but unfortunately we don't have, um, the tracking data for each year is a different group of birds. So we don't have the same birds tracked from year to year. That would be a really, if we had a longer term data for, for individual birds, that would be really interesting to look at. Um, and also potentially compare birds that migrate versus those that don't, because we do have brown pelicans on the coast all year round. Um, comparing the migrants to the residents would be really cool. <laughs> cool, thanks Mariana. Do we have any other questions from out in the crowd? Not seeing any burning questions at the moment. David, do you have anything else? Uh, no, but I, I found the last point of the discussion really interesting actually. It also made me think about uh, 
uh, from one breeding season to the next, and then how you you build your your working landscape so to say at the beginning of the breeding season. That uh, I I thought uh, Mariana, that was a great point. Very cool. Yeah, Juita, do you have any other questions for Brock? No, I think I'm good. Is there anything, Brock, that you think I missed when I covered your paper? Um, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, we don't want to dig into the methods too much in this kind of audience, uh, so no, no need to bear down into that too much. Um, no, it was, a, it was a great paper, Brock. Nice to, nice to see that out there. The, uh, the prey, using the prey base as, a, as a, a layer in these models is something that's often overlooked primarily because the data just don't exist. So it's really great when you can get your hands in, on something like that. Um, and, and the other thing is too, is it's really only, those kind of data sets are really only available in um, countries that can afford to, to take those data. I mean, you go to any, any of the, any non-westernized countries basically, and it's either under a, uh, under a wall, so places like China and such, um, the fishing industry tends to not communicate with scientists. Um, and, uh, and other countries just don't have the infrastructure to do it. So it's, it's really, really nice to, to see that. Um, and I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll probably move on to the next paper, just uh, to, for the matter of time. Uh, Juita, thanks for introducing that paper and thanks for joining us. I, I hope you stay on and, uh, and listen to the discussion for the next paper, of course, and ask questions. Um, Brock, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that, was, uh, that was great. I think with that, we've got um, Kirsten, who's going to be joining us from the Seabird Hearing Group. Uh, let's unmute her. You might actually be able to unmute yourself. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, you're on. And David, I think you're still there. You are perfect. Yes. yes. All right. All right, David, I'm going to hand it over to you to uh, interrogate Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, hi, Kirsten. Nice to see you again. Hi, David. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for joining, uh, and uh, it was typical, all these uh, Danish guys, they vanished into vacation and uh, they left you <laughs> behind to do the job. <laughs> that's, that's, it's my pleasure, actually, so then I can steal their limelight, so it's okay. Yeah, 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 I thought, I thought you were the best uh, to do that anyway. Uh, um, thank you. So we're, we're, we're talking, uh, of course, about uh, hearing in, in birds and in, in seabirds, and mm -hmm. uh, vocalization. Uh, is, is a great topic and uh, there, there has been tons of, of work on the vocalization in birds but uh, and actually not that much on hearing and, uh, and more or less nothing on hearing in seabirds until a few, a few years ago and, yeah. uh, and there were these ideas especially for diving seabirds that uh, hearing uh, must be different or, or maybe uh, that diving seabirds don't hear that well because they have to, to protect their inner ears while, uh, while diving so there were all sorts of rumors um, before uh, you came, basically, and then the group of uh, Magnus Wahlberg at uh, the University of Southern Denmark, and uh, the, the group at uh, Katamindu uh, Station is specialized more in, uh, in whale uh, communication and the water communication, but at some stage you thought, well, it should be fun to, uh, to test this also in, uh, in seabirds. And uh, the, the problem was actually a, a methods problem because to, to work on the audition in, uh, in birds uh, for a while, the, uh, well, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the only way to do this was by uh, working on the auditory uh, brainstem response. And that yeah. unfortunately uh, killed the animal. So that yeah. wasn't too nice. Uh, but uh, during your PhD, you worked using uh, psychophysics and mm -hmm. uh, positive reinforcement techniques. That means mm -hmm. that uh, the bird is underwater and you display noise and then the, the bird tells you whether it has been hearing something. So that yeah. uh, requires a lot of training and a smart animal. And of course, the only seabird uh, capable of doing this was the great cormorant. Mm -hmm. um, no, no mistake. So you, you, you managed to train a, a great cormorant uh, to, uh, to uh, participate in these experiments. And... Uh, it was amazing how these birds uh, heard well underwater, and and you demonstrating that you demonstrated that hearing thresholds in uh, great cormorants underwater were comparable to those of seals and uh, toothed whales. And from there, the, the group has yeah. been building up uh, a series of uh, of papers on uh, seabird hearing, uh, not only on cormorants but also on puffins, 
on guillemots and uh, more recently on uh, on gentoo penguins and uh, you you used a, a range of, of techniques and i i think the the paper we we picked up and we put for display was uh, using the auditory evoked uh, potential uh, technique uh, in uh, in puffins and guillemots and uh, i was wondering whether you could uh, explain exactly how that that works um yeah um i can just to, to quickly i i want to make sure actually that i'm we're thinking because i was thinking you had chosen another paper but we can take them um are you are you looking at the paper where we look at the auditory evoked potential of the puffin and the myrrh yeah that's it that's the one i think in uh journal of experimental biology yes okay okay yeah so so basically yeah, as, as David mentioned, what, uh, what we had done before is we had trained a bird to answer a yes or no question um, and basically take an underwater hearing test. He was stationed underwater, sound was uh, presented to him, and then he responded yes by coming up to the surface and touching a red response target and responded no by doing that, by staying in the station until the trial was over. Um, and that is what we call psychophysics. And so then we, we can determine by testing different frequencies where are the absolute thresholds because when they start to miss um, and respond uh, incorrectly, and then we can get an, an, a picture of what, how well they're hearing. And, um, and we did it first with, with the, the cormorant. That was the first one where we actually did really get these beautiful results showing that they actually hear very well underwater in the frequencies that, that birds hear. Um, since then, yeah, it's definitely expanded to a variety of other birds um, and mostly Arctic and Antarctic and really looking at the effects of anthropogenic noise. Um, so, uh, you know, how is it with, um, with ship traffic and then the ones with the Arctic birds now is actually really specifically looking at um, um, sonars and the effect of sonars and then also uh, with this paper that we're, we're looking at, we are of course looking at in air um, be, uh, to see it. And that was mostly to compare the, how they're hearing compared to the noise that's in the rooker, rookeries and the sounds and the vocalizations that they make. So we, um, we went to Iceland, Northern Iceland, and we went to two different, um, uh, two different rookeries. We went to a, a puffin and then um, a myrrh. And this was the first year we've been back twice now and we were supposed to go up this year to do further investigations on more guillemots um, but covid stopped that really quick so um <laughs> so hopefully we'll be getting up there to test another about 10 10 animals next year but basically um what we did was uh we went out and we were able to since previous testing the animal using auditory evoked potential and this is when we, we kind of, um, we drug the animal so it's slightly sedated. Um, and then we laid it in a, actually a dog kennel that was insulated with foam to try and make it as quiet as possible. And then um, placed a speaker in front of its head and then played sound and then recorded. We had two electrodes that were just uh, subcutaneously under the skin and, and then um, recorded their brain waves. And then by looking and, and looking at the brain waves, then if the sound was, was received um, and received into the inner ear, it would, re it would result in a neural response. Um, and you can see if, if, if they hear it or not. So it's so, a... So, ba so basically a, a method which is uh, far less invasive as, uh, as brainstem response. Uh, and, and, and basically once the, the bird wakes up again up, afterwards, uh, there, there are no consequences for the birds, right? Right, and this, and this was our goal, was to be able to actually do this in the wild and be able to release the animals again, since if, if it's done in the lab, it's required to, to put the bird down after the test, right? Yep. And, 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 um, uh, and yeah? Yeah, yeah, carry on. No, that's okay, did you have a question? No, I was, uh, I was trying to figure, and maybe for a non-specialist, um, how how would you uh, describe the ear of a of a diving seabird? How how does it look like, for instance, in comparison to uh, to the ear of a of a land bird? 
Oh, boy, I not this is where this is where you need Ola, the person who was supposed to come, because he's he's the expert in the anatomy. Um, and it, it is very um, it is very similar. There are some some other small changes, and, and, and that's really where Ola is looking at. He has another paper that I think Magnus sent to you that discusses more the anatomy and the small adjustments um, that they've been able to see in, in certain seabirds that may be attributing to um, this ability to be able to hear underwater. But, but, um, but I apologize, I'm, I'm really not the person no, but I, I think one, uh, yeah, one of the one of the points uh, uh, was was that actually the the year of diving seabirds was not radically different from from that no. non-diving seabirds, and that's the surprising no. thing if you think really of of uh, but especially like the guillemot in in Iceland, you know, they may right. they may dive uh, to uh, to a hundred meters, so yeah. it was probably quite surprising to see that at least. Uh, from an anatomic point of view, the differences were, were not that huge. No, and I think that was the, the big surprise was the results, especially for the underwater, um, you know, results that, that we got was, the, you know, it was previously kind of suspected that birds actually didn't really hear underwater since they had an ear, even marine birds had an ear that was so really designed for in-air hearing and so similar to all other bird ears. Um, and, and the structure and the anatomy was very, very similar. So it's still really kind of a mystery as to how, how they're able to do it. Yeah. And it's and one I'm of the things uh, that Ola is looking at. Yeah. And since I'm, I'm sitting here with a gannet, you know, I, and I can yeah. see uh, uh, them uh, plunge diving, you know, I can't, I, I can't help thinking, you know, what's, what's the prediction then for, for, for gannets? And, and yeah. with respect to the anatomy and the functioning of their ears, how how do you think uh, this could work with uh, the the plunge diving, for instance? I mean, personally, I really I really do think that uh, um, if again if we're looking at the underwater hearing, um, that all birds, just as they are, very similar in 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 air abilities of being able to hear, um, that it's going to be the same, especially for the aquatic birds. Um, and for either if you're looking at plunge divers like the gannets or, um, you know, underwater hunters as, as the cormorants and the, and the guillemots, um, honestly, because the ear structure is so similar and we really don't see any major differences, I don't see there being differences uh, between species, not dramatic differences anyway. Okay. But this uh, this must have been noticed already uh, by by 19th century anatomists and naturalists uh, who were um, cutting up the birds and and looking at this part of yeah. their of their anatomy, right? Yeah, and and um, as I said, I mean, Ola has done a lot more of that, really investigating and and doing um, more of the, the structural and looking at trying to find anything subtle that may be different. And unfortunately, I've never looked at a gannet ear. So it could be, I think that's one thing that we haven't done that could be really interesting. And I, I have suggested that I would very much like to train a gannet <laughs> to, uh, to take a hearing test. Cause I think, it would, I think it would be very interesting to be able to see the difference between um, these underwater hunters. Like right now we're doing king penguins and we have the guillemots and we have the cormorant to all do this underwater hearing test. And then to be able to train a, a plunge diver and see is is there a difference? I mean, are are the the uh, the underwater hunters are they a bit more are they a bit more adapted and have better hearing because they're needing to really listen to underwater auditory cues to find food or determine which direction you know is is the shore and all these other different environmental issues or you know how close is that boat? Um, and where plunge divers don't necessarily need that. Yeah, yeah. No, thank, thanks a lot. And uh, as, as you know, I, I find uh, especially the, the work you, you did uh, using psychophysics on, on great hormones, that was uh, to me one of the most exciting uh, pieces of, of research I've, I've read in, in recent years. And uh, so 
congratulations on this and, and also on the, on the work of the group. And uh, I've been delighted to, to see that you're building up and, and now investigating across a, a wide range of species. So, uh, so well done on, okay. on this and uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Grant. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it sounds like you've got an academic crush, David. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was me. I was, it was truly an honor to have him there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really cool. So I love, I, I love these, these sorts of studies looking at uh, sensory perception in, in seabirds because it's such a, yeah. in some ways, it's kind of a, a bit of an abstract concept. I mean, we, we interpret yeah. sounds and sights as we do, and it's, it's very difficult yeah. to try and interpret what a bird might see or feel or hear. Yeah. Um, my, my question for you is, have you tried doing things like uh, singing songs to it or playing it? <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, have you tried various uh, different types of sounds to see if it elicits just different types of responses? I mean, if I'm listening yeah. to say Iron Maiden, for example, I might have a different <laughs> response than if I'm listening to say Blackbird by the Beatles. Right. Well, we haven't done that. I think still we're such in such a preliminary state of just determining are they, are, you know, are all birds able to hear as well as the great cormorant did? Um, and and um, so, for example, the paper, which I actually thought was that this, I had mixed up the papers, is this one that we actually just uh, published two that shows um, that we did playbacks. So we played different types of underwater different types of noises underwater to find out what kind of reactions we were getting. And we've done this with Gentoo penguins and now we've done this with the MERS. And, um, and I actually have them. So if I play them here, maybe you guys can hear them. So, oh, yeah. um, th so the first one was basically just a white noise buzz. And it sounds, can you? I think what you can do is if you go down to share screen down on your bottom there, you, should, do be that, able to, yeah. you should be able to share. Um, if you go up to advanced, you might be able to share. Yes, desktop. If I just share my desktop, would that be fine? Does that work? Uh, let's see. Can yeah, we, see can, it? we can see your desktop. Uh, you okay. might, be able, might be able to share your sound there somehow as well. Well, I think if the microphone, let me turn on my microphone really loud. Okay. And then, so what, what you're going to actually see now is a video. It's a very short video of just showing the reaction of the MERS to the underwater to the white noise. Cool. It's only four seconds. Oh, yeah. Did you hear it? Just very briefly, but yeah, I got the idea, yeah. yeah. I'm going to try it again so you guys can see. So, so the trick with the MERS is they are very hyper underwater. They're, they don't stay quiet at all, yeah. like penguins do. And they're, they're very, very fast. So we needed to keep them centered in a place. So we had made this little feeder where we hid fish in it. And okay. so when they were busy eating fish, we would play out sounds. And the white noise was the, um, was the, uh, the first one we and what you see is like, and what we did notice was not only did they react to the sounds, but they also fled in the opposite direction of the sound source. So right. that's telling that there is the chance also with direction, being able to determine direction. Um, the other sound we did, which was very different, and it's a military sonar. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's but, really annoying. Piercing. So, and, and it was interesting because the, the female bird reacted more strongly to the military sonar where then, um, or I'm sorry, to the white noise. And then the male reacted more strongly to the, to the, to the military. When you have a sample size of two, it's, it's hard to, yeah. to determine what, what the difference is. Um, so, so these were just to be able to determine for us to be able to say, okay, yeah, um, they can hear and they react to noise. So yeah. if you guys have a second, I have another video which kind of shows exactly what we're doing now. Um, and this is because you guys, of course, all work in the field and I'm very jealous because you're out there like watching it happen. And I'm, I'm in a lab with, with two animals and, and asking, them to, to, uh, asking them a question. Um, so but what you're going to see here is this is our male and he's basically now trained to answer <laughs> Oh, 
Sorry about that. Sorry about oh, that. We're, we're getting to watch a whole new presentation. I know. <laughs> that was not my intention. That was not my intention. I apologize. Um, <laughs> here we go. So let's try uh, this again. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that was good. That was good. That was Dave, Dave Batista. Good actor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, let me see if I can find it just right here. And then, so, no, don't. Um, trying to see if I can find. So, but then it's to show exactly how we trained um, Bismer to answer a question. And what you're going to see here, can you see him now? Yeah. Okay. So if he hears that tone, he has to say, yes, I hear it by touching the red target. Whoa. If he doesn't hear it. That is impressive. And, and then if he doesn't hear it, he has to touch a yellow target saying, I don't hear anything. Ah. That is really cool. I had no clue you could train him to do that. Now I just need to train I'm one to retrieve my beer. Yeah, exactly. Right. See, so he's thinking and he's, and, and so where we are now and, and, and they get this really quick. And I think it's really great because as, as David oh, I said, a, I've done five, I think. as David said, um, we're, we're a lot of a marine mammal lab as well. Yeah. So seeing a dolphin or a or seal do this people don't get excited but you see a bird do this and it's like oh my god they really are as smart as we think you know yeah, yeah that's 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 quite amazing it really puts in really puts their intelligent intelligence into perspective yeah and and what we're doing now is then of course this uh this point where if you can see on this picture i'm going to move this one over oops there we go so this picture right here with the cormorant, this is the setup that David was talking about. We had the cormorant, he was underwater still, and then the sound was presented, he came out. What we're doing with the myrrh, which is this picture here, is now they are actually swimming so that we're getting an accurate, because when the birds are underwater, they're always swimming, they're never still. And he swims through the underwater hoop, and these are sensors here, and when he swims, so is the sound presented. And then he has to swim up to the surface. And then it's here. I don't know if you can see this. This is really bad, probably. But he's right here. He swims through the hoop. And then he has to decide if there was a sound or not. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're testing for the underwater with the, the myrrh at the right. moment, with the guillemot. Yeah. That is really, really fascinating. And he's, is, is the, I assume he's, uh, he's responding to this as well. Or he's, he's, the training is uh, yes. working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we have a female too, and she's being trained. She's currently being tested for the in air, which yeah. which you saw, and then and then where I'm working with him and and getting so that we can start to do the underwater. It does take a while, and I've noticed that the MERS are not quite as quick as the cormorants. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any indication yeah, these guys are um, are um, the word acc acclimating to the noise at all? Not yet. I mean, um, but I mean, now, of course, they're very conditioned to this tone and, and what the tone that you were hearing was is a is a one kilohertz tone. Um, and, and so they're, they're very conditioned to all oh, if I hear that I have to touch this, you yeah. know, and that's, and that's what it is. So it's not acclimating. When we do the playbacks with the different tones, um, the experiments haven't been long enough because we didn't want them to habituate. We really needed to prove that there was a reaction or not. Yeah. So we haven't done a lot, but the, the, the plan with this is that actually to determine how well they hear. And then we want to determine this temporary threshold shift. At one point does the sound, and this is what the military with the sonar is interested in, become dangerous for them. Yeah. And then that's when we'll need to make sure and, and, and be careful that we're presenting sound that they can hear, but it isn't too loud and that they're not habituating. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's very cool. David, if you have any other questions, uh, if not, I'll, uh, uh, Jonathan's got a question in the audience there. No, just, uh, just quickly, uh, Kirsten, uh, uh, don't, don't listen to uh, marine mammal people who tell you that it's fine to uh, publish on a, uh, a sample size of, of one, so uh, continue to uh, to build up, and then uh, and then the uh, the thing uh, Kirsten doesn't say, of course, is that they 
they, they tested and, and seabirds uh, respond positively to uh, swearing in Danish, uh, but uh, they, oh. they haven't published it yet. Good. Really? Who, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I won't. I, I won't say. I won't say the, the swear word in in the. You won't uh, mention it. No, no, no. We'll we'll be taking questions now. <laughs> Quick, pass it oh. <laughs> David, I'll call you later. I want the details. <laughs> uh, all right, John. You, let me see. I'll unmute you. Let's see how long it takes. There you go. You're unmuted. Hey, John. How are you going? Hi. Uh, good. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, everyone, again for for introducing these really interesting papers for spending your time doing this, helping us all out. Um, I'm really asking for a friend uh, today. My colleague Samantha Patrick is leading a project on seabird infrasound. I wondered whether there's any evidence from your experiments whether the alts can hear at infrasonic levels, very low frequencies? Not yet. Um, I think even with the, uh, the auditory um, potential testing that we've done, um, the, uh, it's been at 500 hertz is the lowest. Right, and for sound it's like 20 hertz or less, is that right? Or it's very much lower than that? We, we, yeah, yeah, infra is, is, is much lower. So um, I, I, we haven't had any indication, especially underwater, um, that they, when we did the testing underwater, 500 hertz was actually very difficult to test. He had a really hard time hearing it. Um, but in air, they seem to hear um, 500 hertz, but again, it seems to be the, that that's the lowest level. Okay. We're not, we're not getting, we, we tested at 250 and we didn't get any responses. Okay, that's cool. Thanks very much. I'll pass that on. And if, if you want, you can let me, I mean, I can send you the articles too that show that, the, the preliminary stuff. And then. That's cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, John. Lovely. Any other questions around the audience? Don't see anybody burning at the moment. Um, yeah, the uh, I did have a question in my head then, and I think I got I think I got distracted by uh, by John's question <laughs> about the uh, ultrasonic, or maybe it was uh, just the shine on his head. Juita <laughs> 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 um, might have a question for you, so I'll, I'll I'll unmute her and see if she's got one. Hang on now. There you go, Juita. You're you're on if you have a Hi. question. I may have missed this, um, but did you raise the MERS or? Well, they are captive born. The cap I, okay. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they, they came from, they came from uh, a zoo in England. Oh, gotcha. Because I was like, if we could just train pelicans to sit there so we could put a GPS tag on them, that would be way easier than having to run and catch them because they have wings. Yeah. So like, <laughs> well, and we still, I mean, our goal actually, I mean, and that's the thing is it really, I mean, we would, uh, the training does, it does take a long time. And that's the, the difference with doing, you know, auditory brainstem response or evoked potential is you get, you get it very quickly. I mean, we, uh, the, the puffin paper that just came out was with 10 puffins and we did it in, in 10 days. Um, where I'm wow. still, I'm on year three with the MERS. And uh, so it, it, takes, it takes a really long time to train it, but, but the difference is usually what we see with the auditory evoked potential and then with the psychophysics is, uh, the psychophysics, you actually get much more sensitive results because you're actually asking the animal, do you hear it or not? Instead of just going off of what the brain response is. Um, and so you can get a quick answer with an with a auditory evoked potential, but if you really want to know where the where their real thresholds are, you, you want to ask the animal. But training, training a, a pelican to, to wear a harness or, or something, I mean, I'm, I'm open. <laughs> <laughs> You'll, you'll be well known. You'll be well known to the seabird world. <laughs> I know. I would love it. I, I think that's great. And our goal, our goal really, and unfortunately, we, our, the funding didn't get approved, but our goal was to actually do free flight work with the cormorant and actually do the directional hearing out in the bay outside Catamina and build an array that was out in the bay. And, and then he would swim towards the direction of the speaker that was producing the sound. So we'd have an array of speakers and, and then he would have to go. 
but we didn't get the funding, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that old chestnut. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I would love to do open, open work, you know, like open water work with, with birds. Yeah, yeah I, I, do have, uh, I do have another question for Kirsten, if she can still uh, hear me. So uh, one, yeah. one of the cool things uh, the, uh, uh, the, the group of uh, Nartigal showed in, in Hawaii with uh, some marine mammals is that uh, if, you, if you warn them that uh, there will yes. be uh, a, a very unpleasant underwater uh, uh, noise, then they can react uh, morphologically uh, to protect their ears uh, from, from much stronger noises coming afterwards. Do, do yeah. you think that in, in seabirds and in diving seabirds something equivalent might be conceivable or is it automatically uh, uh, just not possible? I don't, I don't think it's an, atom, an you know, anatomically possible just because um, the, the, the bird ear is just so completely different from a, a cetacean ear or a dolphin ear that are really designed for underwater hearing. Um, and have the ability. I mean, the fact that that Paul, you know, that they did prove this, and that that you know, if they're warned that there's a loud sound coming, they can actually morphologically change the ear so that it it buffers it just as much with 15 dB, which would be the same as us putting an earplug in, and and they and they can do it. Um, but they have a very much more uh, adapted underwater ear than we have, or that birds have. Ooh. Sorry. It would be cool though. I mean, we could just, <laughs> but, uh, but I would, just because we're having such a hard time seeing how they're able to hear so well underwater because it just, their ear is just so similar to an in-air, you know, it, you know, the, the terrestrial birds, but yeah. never say never. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think we're five after six here now. So I think we can, we can start wrapping things up and uh, Kirsten, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it was yeah, really so much. I, all the all the stuff you guys are doing is great. Um, keep up the good work, and we're looking forward to to seeing how you unlock the secrets of seabird hearing. Yeah. <laughs> if I could just teach them to speak, then we would really get far. You, you've got them. You've got them trained to like hitting a yes and no. So that the next that step is, true. is complex sign language. That's true. <laughs> Morse code. Yeah. Morse code. Yeah. Morse code. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, and David, I think everyone is like really excited to actually see the birds now. So if you can, you can turn on your camera for a second. And hopefully, your uh, your camera won't explode. I'm, oh, there we I'm go. I'm trying this now. Oh, we can see you. I can see you fine, anyways. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, cool. That is cool. You're making us all very jealous, though. That's the problem. Yeah. Well, it was not. It was not the aim. The, the aim was to uh, continue the session uh, even while I was I was in the field, it's and, uh, <laughs> and it will be it will be over tomorrow. So it it's uh, it, it won't be that that long. It's it's extreme uh, extreme dedication, David. Extreme dedication. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, thanks very much, and of course, as always, thanks, David. That was uh, that was a really cool session. I'm really glad. Really glad that you're there. I'm just kind of disappointed that you didn't get pooped on. <laughs> well, you, did, you didn't see, uh, I've been sitting here in the box for an hour. You didn't see what was happening in the meantime. Eh? <laughs> you were, you were click, quickly washing your head off. <laughs> yeah. He changed hats twice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, did notice, I did notice that he was wearing an orange one earlier on. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you very much. And Kirsten, thank you. Brock, thank you for joining thank us as well. So uh, David, of course, as always, thank you. Juita, thank you for introducing that first paper. It was great having you along. Uh, we hope to see you around again some more. Um, yeah, and with that, I hope, uh, hope you all have a great week. Next week, we'll be back again at the 6.30 in the morning session, so the 0630 GMT uh, for the Australasian folks. Of course, anyone is welcome to join if you're, if you're able to be awake at that time of day. Um, and uh, then we'll be back to 1600 again in two weeks time. So uh, with that, please everyone uh, stay safe, um, stay inside, wash your hands, wear your masks, be responsible, all that sort of stuff. Don't get sick. That's, that's the key takeaway from this. Um, and take care of yourselves. And we're looking forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Bye everyone. <laughs>